Great. So you guys can see that? Yeah. Yeah, sweet. Okay, so that's kind of the, the thing. You can see it has, has only 11 slides because I've removed over half of it. But it's, um, <laughs> Because yeah, you're presuming so, knowledge of pure script already? Yeah, 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 I do. Um, so just the premise of the whole project was like, what if we could essentially combine the best parts of Haskell and pure script? Um, and then we could write native programs in a pure functional uh, language and produce binaries that have minimal linkage, unless you bring in your own dependencies. What you should be able to produce is just self-confined contained um, binaries in small size. Uh, I want to retain the simplicity of the FFI because I think that's one of the core strengths of PureScript. That it kind of bridges the, you've got this amazing language, but if you do need to do something, it just, you know, you have five minutes to do it, then you can just quickly write something in the FFI. Um, and retains the strict evaluation semantics, which is, I think it's a it's a good good thing, like even though you always want like scratch your head, is this going to overflow the stack or what are the implications of doing it in a certain way? And sometimes you write more code just to just to work around it or to make it tail recursive. At the same time, it's very clear how the program will operate. Like, yeah, it's yeah. Um, the project itself is very unopinionated about how to approach asynchronicity. So when you look at other projects where they have to make a decision at the language level, what sort of like threading approach they want to take. Um, I think Rust is a pretty good example of that where they had N to M and then they changed it later. But if you don't put these concerns in, into the language itself, you can kind of push everything, these sort of concerns downstream to uh, library land. Um, yeah. Then I just, this is kind of what the FFI looks like at the moment. <clears throat> so it is C, so it's not that pretty, but kind of macros go a long way if you use them sparingly, but for the right purposes. So these uh, func things essentially create a, is a curried function. So the first one, the first argument of the macro is you just give it the name. You have to fully qualify the name. And then each of the um, arguments will essentially create a new continuation. And when you evaluate the thing, you have to feed each argument separately. Um, the output, yeah, I'll show more of that later. Um, uh, I'm curious about that. You said that that's a macro? So that's like the C, uh, a pre oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so yeah, like a preprocessor, yeah. Okay. It so that, that, that really runs before the, like, the, the C compiler runs, right? Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. yeah. So how, how did you implement uh, that, that uh, macro? Is that like a I, program that you have to write and do that? Oh, no, no, it's just... Uh, I'll show you the... the I ask because I'm curious about uh, um, how you implement that. Because it, it looks like it's transforming a function from a non curried it's like a tuple of arguments, into. Uh, yeah. A so it's just it's just really just. Um, yeah, the macros are super simple in the sense that they just transform text. You can't even have too much. They they can't really you can't have logic in there, unless you go for something like M4, but the the default C processor preprocessing. It's very simple, and it just replaces tokens. Uh -huh. They've got like you can you can turn tokens into strings and concatenate them, but that's about it. Um, yeah. So this is is this readable? Is it like big enough on the screen? Yeah, I think it looks great. Sweet. So this is essentially the definition of that func one macro. First, you give it the name. And then the A1 is the first argument. And then you have to, the body will be placed in as well. Um, and then I had to do a lot of copy and pasting and just updating them. Because again, it's like, you can't have logic in there unless you do something smarter. 
<clears throat> but I want to have it simple. I didn't want to have like, you know, a lot of these sort of C projects, you open them up and then, oh, here we go. Like, I now have to understand dot in file, dot ac files, dot blah, 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 dot now comes the m4. But it's kind of nice if you just go right to the basics. If you keep things really simple, I'm like, I'm pretty big about simplicity. So even if that means that I have to do a little bit more work on my end, it doesn't matter so much because it'd be simpler to use and understand. So the way the continuations essentially work, or the way you do the queried functions is that uh, yeah. So let's take like oh man. <laughs> Yeah, so essentially all of these functions, because in POC, everything has the same type. So everything is this any type. So for me to have like a, a top level query function, I need to uh, keep it as a any type as well. So at the top level, I create this like, I prefix it with this like random underscore underscore one underscore thing I create. Uh, Essentially, I say this is a continuation. I tell the function where the continuation will live. So this underscore underscore one will point to the actual continuation. So one meaning is the first, the first entry. And at the top level, there is no context. Um, and then because everything needs to be a pointer, I also create a pointer and point to where that is pointing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anyway, so. <clears throat> And then this first func const thing here essentially just captures the current context and then creates one one level deeper. It's just like a whole slew of macros, really. Like then we have got these things where it goes like from continuation one to two, two to three, and then up to twelve. So the error t is kind of kept as to where how much I decide to put in there. But I guess you could. It's quite easily extensible if you needed to. Uh, what's uh, an example of a function that will code gen uh, that that uses this curry or no, not curry the uh, uh, continuation? Because you, you said that this uh, macro helps implement continuations. That's right. So, for example, like this is the um, one of the example modules, example one. What it does is essentially just say, "Give me your name," and then if you give it a name, it will say, "Hello, name." And otherwise, it will just pissed, like will ask you to do it. And in order to do, to print something and to get input uh, from the user, you would have to implement that part in the FFI. So two of the FFI functions are um, put string and get, get line. And the way you would implement those is using a func2. So the first argument being, for example, for put string, the thing that you want to put. And the second argument is essentially not used. It's the thunk part. It's like you pass it null. Does that make sense? Yeah, so this is an example of where you would use it. Um, another one, uh, this one is actually uncurried because I was trying that out. So you can also, there's a different variant of these funks, which it actually, the macro will give back an uh, uncurried function. So similar to how we have this make effect fn2 stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Well, let's Does it see. make sense to you? Yeah, I'm trying to uh, equate this to what I know about the JavaScript backend. The JavaScript backend uses a, continu oh, yeah. a continuation because the node runtime, uh, it's what do you call it, like an event loop system, something like this. So if you want to do something uh, like I oh, no. something effectful, then you have to pass a continuation. Okay, so when I mean, maybe continuation, maybe it's the wrong term then. To me, it's just, you give it a function that you can resume at any point in time. But for example, if I give it a function, if it, with an argument, it returns a function, in a sense, it's a continuation because you capture all of the context you created in the function and you can 
at any point in time resume that. But yeah, so the yeah the way the way lambdas or anonymous functions work when you return them from a function in C is that you essentially capture everything, all your surroundings, and then oh. you return a function a function along with the scope back out, and then you can apply that function at any point in time to you will. When you apply that function, you will essentially bring along the scope that the function requires, and then any additional arguments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where, that's so this where it is, comes from. Okay, so th th this helps to implement the uh, uh, like the first class function, being able to pass functions around, and that's the, right, the yeah. function still has access to the scope. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what that's. Yeah, called. maybe the, the term is a bit overloaded. Given. Yeah, perhaps yeah. so. <clears throat> Well, yeah, this is the uh, equivalent in JavaScript. And then what it would look like in, let's see. So it's it's that thunk at line eight? Well, it looks like I actually didn't update this. Um, never mind, line eight. Yeah, this one, yeah. Actually, I didn't, they're, they're not in sync anymore. But mm -hmm. like if I wanted to write this one, Well, that's just what it would be, right? You just do anything. So that, that would be the equivalent. Mm, okay. Because that um, argument after S in that C macro, then that's like the uh, that thunk. That thing, yeah, the underscore, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that 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 makes sense. Cool. Well, yeah, I guess I guess I, I kind of got us sidetracked with looking at the uh, macros. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> macros are fun and painful at the same time. Yeah. It's good that they, but it's good that they exist because also from an implementation point of view, like it's much easier to emit a piece of macro than it is to emit the actual AST. Like when I know I don't need any introspection as into the internals, I can kind of say like, well, it goes into this black box, it generates code, and I don't have to optimize or like look into it further. It's kind of nice to just like, okay, then I admit it, and I still know it will be in line in a sense because the compiler can't do but emit the code, essentially. It's like a pre-processing step, right? So it's kind of nice, it's, yeah. Kind of move part of the compilation to the C compiler. <clears throat> Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe just like a quick, more general overview of the implementation. So the pipeline, obviously, it goes from pure script. It generates the uh, core representation, and then we take core present representation and generate C, which then goes down to native. Um, yeah. So we bring along a tiny, statically linked uh, runtime library. So it just gives you the, the boxing of the values and the sort of macros that I gave earlier. Um, it's garbage collected, so I decided to use the Boom Dema Visor garbage collector because it's easy to use. Um, type classes, records, and record updates are done using hash maps. Uh, so the type class part, it doesn't necessarily need to be hash maps. It was just the easiest thing to do at the time. Um, and it's something that's easy to update later. So I'll get to that in a second as well. There's a whole lot of like sort of optimization level stuff that could be done that hasn't been done yet. Um, arrays are by dynamically sized sequential arrays. Um, so non constant top level expressions uh, have to be written as tongues. So I showed it earlier as well, I think. Oh, no, I might have skipped that actually. But it's similar where you would essentially say that a value. You essentially say, you say there, there is a value, but you don't put it there. The type's actually thang. But when you use it the first time, you will essentially evaluate it into, um, into static storage. And the next time you run the function, it will return to you what it evaluated. Yeah, 
yeah, immutability by just copying the outer structures. Dynamic values via boxing. And this is kind of like a graph of the of the flow of things. So you've got your project with your C and pure script files. Um, the pure script files will find the way through the um, pure script compiler to give you core of JSON out. And then you take the core of JSON and your uh, C FFI files and send them through the pure C compiler, <coughs> which spits out C code the other end. And then you feed that into your C compiler, GC, C or C links are obvious examples. And then uh, you get your object files and you link them and off you go. Um, so it's like a quick overview of the runtime. We can go into as much detail as you like, really. Um, so the runtime essentially just uh, provides you with the dynamically typed values. So there's pure any value that you can see in the code example. Essentially combines the tag and the value, the tag identifying how the data is to be interpreted, interpreted and the value being uh, just a union of the different types that it can assume. Yeah. So whenever we run a function, we would essentially check what is the tag of this thing? Is it valid for this function? And then it would hit an assert if it wasn't. And the idea is that it shouldn't be possible to go into the wrong functions because the Fusion compiler would have made sure of that early on. Like if you have got, if you add two integers, then you should be getting two boxed integers. If one of them is not an integer, for example, it will hit an assert and pop out. Whereas when you compare that to JavaScript, they will I don't know exactly how it's implemented, but they would have a similar system and they, they made a the decision that, well, if you hit two of those things, hmm, and then you get a string big or something like that. <clears throat> uh, so ah, this is actually outdated. Yeah. Uh, it was my takeaway that I kind of went on about that there's a nice, there's a certain beauty to the simplicity of C. Um, and that procedural programming can actually be quite pleasant, which uh, I had to find. So it seems that the culprit is the object orientation in particular, because both, it's just, I know this is going kind of on the rant, but like there is like, there is logic to functional programming and there's logic to procedural programming in their own rights. They have a certain basis of, in reality. And then some object orientation come along and it doesn't relate to anything. And yet that's kind of what people are stuck with. It's, yeah. So future work stuff that hopefully will happen in the future is uh, implementing more uh, libraries, implementing more compile time optimizations, um, getting the TCO flying. <clears throat> Yeah, inlining type classes, uh, as I was saying earlier, doesn't have to be hash maps. Um, unboxing values where possible. So when, uh, AS, when I can see in the AST that these things are directly next to each other, then I don't need to box them. I can use optimizations at compile time. Um, inlining functions where possible. Um, yeah, more tooling. Yeah. So actually one of my wishes was to do expand more macros at compile time. Um, I think now that I've switched away from the blocks extension to writing these first class functions myself, it's not so much of a big deal now, but one of the negatives of using macros is that you don't, if something, like if you step through your program using GDB or whatever, then you, you kind of just look at the macro and let's say you've got a macro which encapsulates 200 lines. Well, and the only thing you know is that your problem is in a macro. Whereas if you actually emit the whole code and something goes wrong, you have a place, you know, you know, um, you have a, like a line you can go to and can have more context. Oh yeah, and I was just closing slide. Yeah, that's it. Oh, so if you use GDB, it maps the currently running instruction back to the original source code file. That's right. So if in the original source code, it's just a macro, then like you can't do anything with debugging really. Is that right? Yeah, as far as I'm aware, yeah. 
Interesting. Nice. How do you do the uh, debugging? Do you just use this like terminal uh, GDB command? Or yeah. So like a, a, a graphical. Sorry. Or do you use like a graphical interface onto the debugger? No. Nah. It's just a <laughs> yeah, a good portion of printf and GDB. <laughs> so when I, yeah, when I, I get a second. I remember seeing that when I was uh, 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 like a very fresh programmer. And I was poking my head at C, and people say, oh, you should use GDB. Like, okay, GDB. Like, let's look at this. And this, this command line stuff, and there's keyboard shortcuts. We're going up and down. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to use this. It's like <laughs> bro, debugging is way too hard for me, I guess. I guess it's impossible. But maybe, maybe now after I have more programming experience, it's possible. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, it comes kind of back to the simplicity again. <laughs> in my opinion, because, yeah, because yeah, the, it might look intimidating. There's like a lot of stuff on there, but it's probably like the simplest way to solve the problem. Like, can you think of a simpler way to debug a program? Because when you start bringing in like user interfaces and then you have to like suddenly you, you're solving like a different problem in a sense. Because at the end of the day, what you want to do is just debug your program. You don't care what the buttons look like or where, like, you have to go like three menus down to find something. GDB or other command line utilities, you can just look up the help and you find what you need. So it takes space. And, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I like it. <laughs> yeah, Supi asks the question. Uh, he says, oh, yeah. hey, Felix, great work and thanks for the presentation. Is there any specific oh, yeah. program? You plan on writing using PRC? Uh, no. no. <laughs> I just kind of. You, you plan on writing the PureScript compiler in PRC? <laughs> well, no, not not not. Oh not, yeah, I guess, not I guess so. that's a good one. Yeah. The PRC compiler uh, in PRC, right? Well. That's right. Yeah. So I think when once that is once that happens, I can kind of call it. I guess depending mm -hmm. on like if people actually have interest and want to keep going with that, then let's do that. Otherwise, that's kind of like my current goal. If we can get it to a point where it's self-hosted, it's pretty sweet. Yeah, so, I agree. Um, I, I have a question about, let's see, back a few slides, you're talking about a runtime. Um, I am curious about, uh, to hear more exactly about what that means. Uh, uh, so. When I say runtime, essentially all I'm talking about is this library that you always have to compile against. Mm -hmm. It's not like a, you don't have to load some shared object or anything like that. The only thing it essentially does is gives you the, the, the boxing of the values. So that uh, showed up in the slides as well. So you've got this. Mm -hmm. uh, where is it? Yeah, so you've got this any type. It essentially just combines the tag and the value. So you Essentially, you take you know, it's like an ADP and on on C level, um, and it's always made of. Essentially, you can have any of these tags associated with your value, <clears throat> and the value itself is a union. So, I think at the moment it's like. Uh, I actually don't know on top of my head. I think it's like size of returns like 16 or something. I don't know. It's it's all it's so essentially every value will have the same size, which is kind of nice as well for um, like from from my where I'm sitting because it makes things simple. When I for example scopes and I want to bring over the values, all I need to know is I can just put them like in sequential memory and I can just say I can index into the memory saying like over here, over here, over here. I don't have to worry about, you know, yeah, I don't have to worry so much about addressing them properly so it like reads the right amount of bytes at the right amount of uh, offset. Yeah. It, make, it makes things like, nice and simple. Um, yeah, I mean, that's really it. I mean, if you go to the, the head of file, <clears throat> 
sorry, this is a header. Yeah, so um, essentially, just it has a whole bunch of like allocation functions and then functions to kind of work with it. But that's that's it as far as runtime is concerned. Like it doesn't it doesn't bring anything else in, just the basic data structures and how to work with them, and it kind of wraps them up in this um, first any type. So uh, yeah. the C code that you bring into a pure C program, like via FFI. So if if I make an mm -hmm. FFI file and I write some C code in there, do I have to think about this runtime? Um, because all the values, like like all the values that is emitted, that is worked with in by the pure C compiler, is boxed, right? Yeah. And yeah, and it's you in need that kind of tag data structure, tag and value data structure, right? Yeah. So if mm -hmm. in a C code, I have to return some boxed value, right? So that means I have to be concerned with the uh, runtime system in some way. Yes. Yes. So it's like a double-edged sword in a sense that, um, so one of the cool things about the C 11 backend is that you look at the FFI and it, it's easy to read. It, you return an int and then I don't, it somehow like wraps the value up or I, I don't actually understand how it works and that's kind of a problem for me is that I can't trace how it works. Whereas here it's like, it's very explicit, maybe too explicit, but at least it's like I can follow it. Um, yeah. Now you need to be very aware of how things are laid out and how they work. There's no magic, nothing that kind of does it for you behind the scenes. Microservices is, is as far as it gets and you still have to use them. So for example, this is the, um, the area apply a function, so bring up the JavaScript equivalent. So it looks like this. Yeah, so in JavaScript, you would, for example, just start using the values, but in the CFFI, you would first need to unwrap them. So you, you have to first essentially check, is this the right tag? If so, then get me the value and we interpret it as, for example, here a persvec t, uh, and then you essentially, yeah, then you essentially just run over the implementation. Uh, sorry, over the, yeah. Does it make sense? I mean, you you can't just you can't just do something like this where you would say like n equals zero. You would have to say like n equals and then wrap it up. Zero. Yeah. So where, where, where do you do that wrapping in the C code? Um, so n was a bad example because it's just a local variable, but if you were to return it back into the system, this is like one of the wrapping operators functions. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so that'll, that'll put it into a box. In a that's way. right, yeah. So out will be um, just the first vec t, and the, pers the box for first vec t essentially pers any T that is tagged as being um, an array. So when I get when I this unboxing function here would essentially check is this actually um, tagged as being an array, and if so, it will return it. Otherwise, it will hit an assert. So, yeah, yeah it should be technically impossible unless the FFI is stuffed. And that's really interesting. I remember um, talking about on the topic of boxed values. Um, and there's a, a, a well, it's not a full full Haskell spec, but there's an implementation of a very Haskell-like language that uh, that the primary motivation was that to experiment if they can you know, compile to unboxed values mm. in the program. I think the name of the that compiler is called like. Four seven or seven four, or it's some numbers. Okay, I should find that on GitHub. Yeah, that should. That sounds cool. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think I guess the more you know about the program and compile time, the more stuff you can erase. Right. So you'd need all the type information. 
I, yeah, you would be guessing. I because I have not like properly explored it. I can't, I can't really right. talk to it. But I imagine that if you have more like sort of type level information, can you emit it? Mm -hmm. You can you can probably remove some boxing or because at the moment I essentially have to treat every value as put in a box and kind of yeah. There are some cool things that I that I could do. Um, so for the optimizations, let's bring up the project again. So this is the inliner optimizations, like a lot of the stuff is uh, ported from the PureScript code base, so it might look familiar. Yeah, what I, what I thought was kind of cool was that um, as you as you go over the AST and if you can see that there's two <clears throat> two integers being boxed up just to be added and put into a new box, you can essentially remove the boxes and just have one box, and then and then at that point you already have the two integers and you kind of know what they are going to be doing, then you might as well do it for them. So it's kind of cool that you can. Evaluate some simple expressions at compile time as well. Not that it really matters, but I thought it was just. I wonder if that so, that sounds kind of like uh, uh, the values are they, they behave monadically, <laughs> right? Like you can collapse the structure around these two values uh, without oh, yeah. affecting yes. the way that these combine, these compose. Yeah, I guess it is. It boggles my mind, like because when you have like all these things that make functional programming awesome, like purity and immutability, and we look at them as like great things, but really they should be like the. It seems to me like it makes everything so much easier, even from like a language point of view, implementing a language. That it kind of boggles my mind that we went down this. Like I mean, as a profession, that we went down this entire like object orientation and mutation route. It's, it's, it makes things so much more complicated when you look at the stuff that, I mean, maybe JavaScript is a bit of an ex extreme example, but yeah. It, like, there's people that actually write like static analysis tools for JavaScript. That must be so incredibly difficult because like anything goes at any point in time, right? Whereas when you say like, well, nothing can be mutated or um, you can't do IO and these sort of things, like suddenly like a lot of problems just go away and things become simple. Yeah. And, uh, let's see, I, I, there's, I just remembered a question I wanted to ask was about, uh, there was some effort in the, uh, in the I don't know, a, a few months ago, several months ago to uh, work towards a proper spec for the pure script language and a spec in which I'm, I'm guessing that they have to specify what happens if you take an integer and an integer and add them uh, right or like what type of integer there is so like in pure script the integers specification is whatever the javascript in, uh, integer specification is Mm -hmm. I wouldn't like like uh, how many that. how many decimals a number can have, for example. Um, so from from my reading of the PureScript code base, it does not make any such assumptions until the point it knows it's going to JavaScript. So I know there is a check um, somewhere in the core implementation files that an integer is only a certain size, and I think that's the only thing that happens in compile time. Um, right, but and, that's. That's uh, how the compiler is implemented. Um, but like from a language point of view, like without knowing how the compiler is implemented, if you have a number, you want to know the details of like, like, the, like the number primitive, like there's a primitive uh, that's a number and you want to know how accurate that number can be. Like that's like somewhere that has to be defined. But why does the compiler need to care? 
Uh, that's a good question. So, yeah, I mean, I can try to bring it up. Well, I guess part of a language is this, there's a syntax and the semantics of the language. Like for the syntax, it doesn't matter. Um, but for the semantics, like if you care about the semantics, then I guess you could also um, just say that. Yeah, matters. but I mean, you, well, I guess at yeah. the same time, it's like, in, the, the, the semantics don't change just because your machine can't, or like your whatever can't properly represent the addition of two extremely large integers, right? Like conceptually, you should be able to do that. So from a language point of view, I don't, if the language wants to be platform agnostic or whatever, then it shouldn't tie itself to those limitations. I mean, conceptually, it makes sense. And that's just my personal opinion. If it, if it makes sense for two integers to be added, uh -huh. like, yeah, maybe I'm like way off base there, but it seems to me like that would be the case. Because I, I guess if we want to make a, a like a safe addition operation such that you add two numbers and uh, like it behaves like it behaves laws like so if you add these two numbers because there's a a bounded enum instance I think for the numbers that's right yeah. so then like but it's all libraries and stuff what's that but it's all implemented in libraries right so this is the bounded C implementation for just to give an example. Right, and then you, and then the uh, bounded one for JavaScript is different. Like they don't, they don't have to do the same thing, right? Uh -huh. Unless that's what you're getting at. Yeah, like as a well, I, I guess I guess that's that, that's one of the things I'm curious about is if if I write a a program in in the PureScript language and then I run that in the JavaScript backend, I compile to run in the JavaScript backend. I compile that same program to run the C backend. Should they behave the same, like identically, or should they, uh, or or not? Not, not in my opinion. No, that was not one of my goals because they are two different platforms, and you get the best out of a platform if you build for a platform. So I would say that PureScript as a language is amazing, and like it lends itself really well for what I'm trying to build, I think, but I was not trying to make it so that you can write one program and run it in multiple places. Mm -hmm. I essentially just wanted to have like this amazing language and then combine it, you know, with a native backend. Yeah, and I think there's a spec for C and I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm curious about the value of having a spec for a language. Like there's, there's a specification oh, yeah. for the C language and mm -hmm. well, like, I'm not sure if you, I haven't looked at it, but I presume there is. Oh, and I, I wonder if the value of having that is that other people can build a compiler for the same language, targeting the same backend. And so a person who writes a language, uh, who, who implement, writes a program for like using GCC, then they know that they can, if they can take any spec compliant compiler yeah. and then just switch the compiler out. And then like, I wonder if that's, the, that, that's one of the a few benefits of, Having a specification. Yeah. 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 Well, I guess, yeah, I guess a lot of that, um, a lot of that question was motivated by like what number, like how did you implement the integer primitive, the number primitive? And yeah, it's essentially just one step. I think it's just the in 32. Just, it's just the one, the one that's built in the C is in 32. Yeah. So if somebody makes an issue on the pure C project and says that uh, this doesn't match the same number of decimal places that, a, that, that the JavaScript backend uses, like mm -hmm. you say, well, that, that's a JavaScript backend. Like we're in the C backend. So we, we want. Uh, that would be my response to it. Yeah. I mean, I'm like <laughs> open to discussion. And everything. No, it's just, I, I, I'm happy to be conv convinced. Otherwise it's always. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Also, I, th I think I think it'd be an interesting, interesting discussion. Um, yeah. it'd be, it'd be, I wonder if you can make that configurable. Like, you just add some hooks, such that um, for any one project, it can specify which implementation of integer it wants to use. Yeah, sure. But I mean, the problem is going to be more far-reaching than just integers, right? How do you like solve that problem generally? I guess you first need to have the specification. 
it's happening. Yeah. Is it, I don't know. Like, I don't know how far reaching this is. Yeah. Uh, having something like behave the same across platforms or whatever. I remember seeing something in Agda that uh, uh, lets you define the implementation of some primitive uh, in in line with define well not um, not primitive yeah maybe it is primitive I don't know but yeah Agda has something interesting with the way that uh, it defines the primitives in the language mm. yeah I I, I don't know I'll have to take a look at that later. But yeah, 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 yeah. I guess this kind of goes back to like uh, the discussion of like the runtime system. Like, what is a runtime system? What should the um, uh, uh, responsibility of a runtime system be? Like, I got um, like like I asked this because one instance or one um, definition could be uh, an effect. Uh, like, you just return. Uh, it's like the peer script run, right? Like you just like you emit a, a list of effects that you want to do, and then like the runtime system just runs those effects, like an effect runner. Like I guess it could be something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah. Oh yeah, another question I had was uh, um, so so now now that you've you know gotten the Pure C project working, uh, how hard is it for uh, for somebody to look through this code base and change the um, change what gets emitted to be something like Lua code or um, uh, so like, I can't, I can't in good conscience like take credit for most of the code in mm -hmm. the sense that I wrote it, but a lot of the ideas, like I would not have been able to write it without having the pure 11 stuff come before me and have the pure compiler come before me. Mm -hmm. For me, it was essentially going through there and learning, learning, learning. So for somebody to write a Lua backend, they are now no further ahead than they were before I did any of this, in a sense. I mean, now they've got like a pure script thing to look at, but pure script is, I mean, syntactically not that far removed from Haskell <clears throat> in the broad scheme of things. Mm -hmm. That if they were capable of doing the one, they would have been capable of doing the other. So, no, nah, well, this is my, my personal opinion. Yeah. If somebody wanted to do it. I, uh, well, um, it's another example, you know, that they can run with. Mm -hmm. Right. I, well, I, I see. Like one of the big, big values is uh, parsing the core fun, like the core function stuff, right? Yes. So that was not my work, actually. Mm -hmm. um, the poor young. Well, I, I suppose. I picked also, up the library for the. After yeah. it's parsed, uh, somebody could um, because after it's parsed, you want you want to do some common things to the uh, that s abstract syntax, syntax tree, right? You want to yeah, traverse over it and do something, right? Yeah, so you should be able to do some of the transformations, like this one I'm looking here right now, the function composition inlining. I think that should be possible just on the core of end itself. Um, if I'm not mistaken, or like other transforms. I mean, some things are like target specific, like doing a TCO or whatever, but other stuff could certainly be done at the core of end level. Um, I'm not sure if the right place is like, yeah, I mean, the right place is the core of end, but if that is before it gets written out during compilation, or if that's like additional passes you can take on top, like in a you know like a, kind of in a pluggable way or not, I don't know. That's not really my, my place, I suppose. Okay. Certainly cool that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I wonder if you can walk through the uh, uh, compilation process that uh, Pierce. Yeah, mostly. So, if you're familiar with the um, Pearson code base, then some of the stuff might look familiar. <clears throat> So the idea is that essentially you compile a module, you take the uh, core rep module and you turn it into a, a, uh, an array of AST. So the AST is, it looks like this. I try to keep it fairly small and this finds its origins as well in Pure 11. So I, could, I try to give credit wherever I can because it's like some of this stuff. Um, so this, this so is essentially- Where, where do you parse the core FN? So the part, I, I'm not, uh, so that's the entry point. So as far as I'm concerned, like on the implementation level, I've got a type of core fan and how it got there is not really my problem. It, from like, from a compiler point of view. Um, but the actor passing from JSON into that representation is happening somewhere around here. It's just calling out to something. Hold on. Um, Yeah, so here line 139. Yeah, that's all it's doing. Compile module. Yeah, so essentially you read just- Read the text file. Um, and then that core symbol there, that's uh, this AST. Yeah, so the, you essentially get the JSON, you turn that into the core representation. So it's this, this core binding here. Mm -hmm. And then you essentially use that core representation to derive the, um, in the C context, the header and the implementation files. And then you print them and then you're done, essentially. And you copy the FFIs over and that's about it. Um, so yeah, the, the, so most of the work happens as soon as you enter this module to AST thing. The rest around it, like, I mean, you could have written a rest around it a million different times. It's, so um, here, module refers ways. to a, uh, a module in the core. Yes, 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 in the core representation. Yeah. And then that changes it into a C AST? Yes, so this function here, module to AST. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I think this whole thing is running like a whole bunch of different monitor transformers because, uh, because you need across all of these things, you need to have fresh variables, access to fresh variables. So mm -hmm. you get like a monitor supply flying around in there, um, except T just to capture the various errors that can occur. Yeah. C A S T. Um, I'm I'm just really curious, like what this what the like how you made the C A S T. So CAST is like how complex is the definition of that CAST type? Yeah, it's just it's just a because the CAST a describes what a C program looks like in structured form. Yeah, right? but it's sim similar to the um, one for PureScript, and then it's very simplified. Mm -hmm. So like you kind of can pick and choose what you want to do, and then. Um, yeah, you can just pick and choose the things that you want to use of the language. Like if you want to do a proper C AST. Okay, so this AST data type, you define this yourself, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay. Oh, so yeah, so now we are so like, so yeah. This isn't uh, conformant to some C specification somewhere. This no, not at all. That was my, actually, one of my approaches was to like find some sort of BNF or whatever that I can generate to from, but at the end of the day, like I don't need half of this stuff. 
Yeah. You only need it small, and it makes it much simpler as well if you kind of take like an opinionated look at it and reduce it to like the things that you're actually going to be working on. Mm -hmm. So even sometimes when you uh, chuck in a cast or whatever, then if you compare two values, then you need to check out, oh, is this value behind the cast or is this, yeah. Just so makes not, things a bit simpler if you. Uh, the, the part of this that I find interesting is this, I mean, these look pretty generic, like a character literal, struct literal, numeric literal. I mean, if you did a little bit of massaging, you could make this uh, mm. describe the AST for a few different languages. Like this. Yeah, script. actually, that's been crossing my mind as well. Like, also, oh, sorry, continue. If, if, if we had more time or if there was some of a concerted effort, I think this would be possible. Like, as you already correctly realized, these things are very generic, they occur in a lot of different languages. Mm -hmm. And I think that it should be possible. Like, if there was some sort of effort to actually do this, it wouldn't be like one person job, I think. Um, to build something that, you know, similar with like build token parses, we like, well, a lot of languages look like this. Here, let me give you something that you can like parse your own language with. Like, do something the other way around. Like, a lot of languages look like this. If you <laughs> produce an AST, then I can. Uh, then you can essentially just write a printer for the for the AST that targets the right language. Does that make sense here? So, if, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that would be cool. But that's it. I mean, some stuff down here is fairly specific, like the. Um, where is it? I guess like the C struct. That's kind of C specific. But yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Of, I, I feel mm -hmm. like other languages have that idea, same idea. Yeah, the same idea, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't even think I'm using that much. Oh, no, I am. Yeah. And then uh, most of the work is happening in the transformation function that goes from the core rep to the AST. So I think they, this is probably the one that's be the most useful for getting to understand the people who are interested in understanding it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if somebody wanted to make a backend for a, a different language um, mm -hmm. other than C, they would take this function, right? Module to AST and that mm -hmm. AST type definition and you slightly adjust that AST type definition it's just so it describes has a few of the nuances of the target language and then you would just rewrite or adapt this module to yeah, that's right. function. So, so we should be able to write like this this function should be possible to be written only once for some AST that describes an imperative language like a we can find some sort of like common set of features that a language has, and then we can write this thing once, and then that would be, that would be a really cool project. And then you take that, yeah. Sorry, how do you mean? Um, are, are, are you talking about using okay. one data type to describe multiple languages? Yeah, I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? Like if we had some sort of like AST that is general, but powerful enough to represent uh, yeah. like the common denominator of a whole bunch of sort of imperative backends, then we should be able to just write like one of these um, module to AST functions that targets it, common AST. And we go from the common AST using another function. So it's kind of like core representation to core imperative <laughs> representation. And then you go from that to some other backend. I mean, that would be yeah. pretty sweet. Yeah, but I don't know. I'm skeptical of that. I feel like there's something in that AST type that is, it will, it has to have something specific to a language uh, for efficiency's sake, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the efficiency things that if, if you say like, if like you say this common language would be a stack based language, then one of those things would be to make sure that you have TCO in there. And for TCO, you already need certain constructs that just need to be a given in that language. So, yeah, I mean, like finding finding that ground 
be the hardest part, I think. Mm -hmm. so like to find what, what are actually the core sets. We saw a language this. Mm -hmm. Which is, by the way, one of the beauties of C again. I mean, I kind of went on around on this before, but the simplicity of it is that it, it gives you just enough that you don't even have first class functions <laughs> because you don't need to. So if you say like this representation is like, I think you could model it actually pretty close to what C would be. Like, I think we could even use this as a starting ground, what I've built, and kind of remove the C specific aspects. I think that, that would be actually possible. Yeah, I mean, to, to, to paint the, kind of make that point, I guess, when I implemented the object update stuff this morning, the, um, the pure script backend would use features like for in, which is like very JS specific. Um, yeah. Just or like object, uh, uh, like object assign or extend or something like that. Yeah. But if you didn't have, have any of the sort of stuff, then you could, yeah. Like every language will have some sort of for loop, right? Or some sort of while loop or something like that. Yeah, except for Haskell. <laughs> no, I mean like any imperative language. Oh, right, imperative language, yeah. Sweet. But yeah, seeing this is really empowering. Um, seeing that all, like to make a back end, all you'd really need is just this function and data type, I think. Well, how about the pretty printer? Is that difficult? Uh, that is not my finest piece of work. <laughs> 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 it just isn't. Um, yeah, there's nothing to show there, really. I mean, I could bring it up, but. Like, I kind of went with this extremely inefficient way of doing it, just because it's easy to, like, Mm -hmm. Keep it in my head, yeah. So, like, I went for this right at, like, it's super inefficient. The, the, does it care much about indentation levels? Yeah, so because I need to keep indentation levels in there, so I would have, like, with next indent level, so it would say essentially change the, for the, for the action that I'm going to give you, change the indentation level by two, and whenever you call this indent thing, it would essentially emit, like, indentation size times n on the white space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not too bad, I guess. Probably similar yeah. to what I would Just, do. Just, I mean, like from a, from a, like, it's read, like, what I like about it is it's readable, but what I don't like about it is it's just not very efficient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. And sometimes I get like double double semicolons and stuff. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really break anything. It's just not very pretty. You don't need spaces in C, do you? Um, do what? It's primarily for debugging. For for which? What do you don't need? Sorry, I didn't. You don't need indentation. Oh, indentation? No, 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 you don't. Right. No. That's you just need a semicolon. Kind of say like the statement is finished. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's really nice, because yeah, yeah. Uh, like I do, um, I've done Salesforce development historically, and that's like a, a version of Java, like the kind of language that they that you can program in. Uh, it doesn't have. It's it's like uh, it remo removes a lot of language, a lot of features that Java has. But I've always wondered, like, um, is it possible to compile to like make a backend to that very very dumb Java language from uh, like a language like PureScript? Mm. Yeah, that would be cool as well. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah, that yeah that that's why I, I I'm very curious to see like what kind of uh, like AST stuff you did. Yeah.
Um, I think I think that's all the questions I had. I, I spent a few minutes here thinking about any any other one. Um, I don't, I don't, we, we should see the uh, project page on GitHub, um, or maybe just the README or something. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what, like, I was trying to, like, what I'm going for is that it's easy to get started for people who want to help out. So, mm -hmm. trying to pitch this as a project, it's, it's a fun hobby project to work on, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, I did pay a lot of attention to, like, writing clean, clear code. So, it's not some guy just hicking away some fully written code just to get stuff going. Like, I put a lot of effort into making it discoverable, easy to understand, and follow. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if there's, if there's something like you go into the code base and you turn around like, holy moly, then let me know about that. Because <laughs> I was definitely trying to like, yeah, I want to make it approachable right now. Like, for me, like one of the, like there's a lot of beauty to functional programming. What, what one aspect of it in particular is that it's very easy to like read code, in my opinion, and then kind of reason about what's going on. Mm -hmm. So taking it, like full advantage of that, it's like one of the things I'm trying to do. So if there's something not quite right, and let me know about it, or open an issue or something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, yeah. There's one other thing I was curious about was garbage collection. Yeah, that's right. You said that you use the Bohm garbage collector. Um, yeah, I've, I've heard of that once before when I was playing with the Nix project, the Nix and Nix OS. Uh, I think the language parser and uh, build system and stuff uses mm -hmm. the Bohm garbage collector. Uh, can, um, can, can you show where that's used, like how you do garbage collection? Is that is that in is that in, is like, e or is that in the pretty printer in which you care about garbage collection? No, it's much simpler than that. So essentially all all you have to do is call GC in it, which from my understanding is not even necessary on all platforms, but it doesn't hurt if you do it. You initialize this thing and then you essentially use like the dedicated malloc functions. So you use like the set of uh, sort of memory allocation reallocation functions, you don't use free, and you get everything for free at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be aware to some degree, like you need to be, you need to like, in your mind have mapped out how things like point each other, so you don't accumulate garbage that doesn't, it can't get collected. So you have to be aware of your roots to some degree, and then make sure that, yeah. Just make sure that you don't hang on to objects, and that you do hang on to other objects that you don't want to be that you don't want to be collected too soon. So, uh, for example, I've got this wrapper type right here on the right hand side behind managed new. So, I, this AFMT function would uh, malloc using the normal system. The no, sorry, not system. The the normal uh, the standard malloc function. So it's unmanaged memory, but then I can put it behind this thing and uh, use like a, um, you can register a finalizer with the GC. So you can say when the container gets collected, then you will collect the internal, the data as well. Um, so you can kind of run your own cleanup logic if that's suitable for this use case. And here it is, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really all there is to it. Um, so I've got this, uh, where is this? It's in the header. You said that you need a a garbage collecting root, right? Um, what what is the root of a pure C program? Is that somewhere like main? Up in main? Like that's it's like just main, yeah. Um, the process start like you, you have to declare like at like here's the root. <laughs> how does how do you declare the garbage collecting root? 
So here on the left hand side is the main function that gets emitted if the module that you're compiling is the main module. Uh -huh. Sorry. Yeah, so essentially the first thing you do is initialize the garbage collector and then following on from that you would um, you would apply the real main function that you actually wrote in your in your module. Mm -hmm. So this is just the yeah, this is like the C main, the entry point, and you would go from there and uh, start doing your own thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how that uh, GC init thing works, but that kind of sets the well, root. Yeah, well, I, to be honest, I don't either. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah that, that's amazing that uh, the bomb garbage collector lets you just do this. That's amazing. Yeah, I, yes. I was so surprised. This is it. Uh huh. And then it's somewhat, like it tracks your pointers, like it, like somehow they're built into the, into the allocation scheme, like the necessary uh, information to be able to track your pointers. And somehow it also checks, like, okay, I can see like when you use the malloc function, right? That you can keep a little bit of uh, bookmarking with your, with the data that you return or whatever. But it also checks, like it needs to also check like the current stack memory on the, like in stuff that was like allocated on your way to the current stack frame. I, like honestly, I don't, I don't know, I, it just works. <laughs> um, so my way of verifying that it works is essentially write a huge program. Then uh, really cool. Yeah, like and then run it. I don't know, a thousand iterations, and then call the GC like crazy here and there, and yeah, do like a whole bunch of like. Um, actually, for it here. Like I just do a whole bunch of stuff, like a like a lot of times, and then I run the program and call it GC in between. And I'm kind of just like throwing stuff at it and see if it falls over. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's probably not the right way to do it. <laughs> oh, what but is the very, run GC function? Very effective. Hey? What is the run, run GC function? Uh, this is, you can essentially manually kick off the collection. To okay. Yeah, it doesn't mean that anything will collect it, be collected, but it, it runs through its cycles. Yeah. So like it marks objects for collection and then, yeah. Because like I, I'm just trying to recall my understanding of how a garbage collector works. Uh, like in JavaScript, it's like the runtime like system, like like the JavaScript, yeah, the runtime system. It has this uh, mark and sweep. So every once in a while, while a program is running, it will look at the tree of all the data that's it's storing or using right all the memory that's being used and look at that you know, tree and um it marks what's being used and then the next time that the garbage collector runs it will um you know crawl the crawl the tree again and see what's not being used anymore and then free that yeah so it's that's like, like it, it depends on the garbage collector being run periodically while the while the program is executing Yes, that's right. Yeah. So the Bohm garbage collector does this uh, run periodically while a pure C program is running? Yes. So okay. that's like one of the things that makes it a bit hard to. Um, so I think it uses like, at least on Linux, it uses the pthread library, and then it will from time to time do its passes. Okay. And it's like you don't really have control as to when they run. You kind of just hand off, and let it do its thing so i would like you would get different results on different runs okay so when i have yeah. like yeah so that's why you kind of my way to flushing out these bugs was essentially like run a program like crazy to kind of force these things to come on faster um, otherwise they can go unnoticed for quite a while and the way the allocation works it would free it would like say well now you can use this piece of memory again and then you start using it again but you like it was kind of nice because in this, um, when the only thing you keep allocating is essentially these box values, they have like the same size. So suddenly you would have like, the tag would be different, but the value would be like a string or something out the end. And yeah. Yeah, so you get like these mismatches happening. Hmm. Yeah. But you always get valid point like, when I was work when I was 
debugging these things because they have the same size, you always get valid pointers back. So it was a bit easier to kind of figure out, to debug the program, even though it was. OK, so like the garbage collector, it kind of runs on a parallel thread, and it inspects the other thread somehow. Or maybe, maybe they use some shared memory to remember what's not being used anymore, and then behind the scenes on a separate thread. Something yeah, like again, I, Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I, I guess if people are curious, then they can go look at the bone, bone collector, bone garbage box. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, people that spend their lifetime on that stuff. So I, as long as I know how to use it, I'm happy to hand off. <laughs> because even, even reading through the header files, it's like, it's a world of its own. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are those uh, memory, the, the, the memory allocation and deallocation, are those C functions or like preprocessor pre functions? Or is it like a C library that that is? Or is it built into the C language? They will be built into the C language. I don't know how they will. I, I, again, I have not been in the implementation. OK. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So if, if somebody wanted to target the language that doesn't have this foam garbage collector, um, then, you'd have, you, then you, you have to worry in that language. Like, well, I guess. Uh, I'll have to make a garbage collector for this this backend because this language doesn't have uh, this this language requires a garbage collection and doesn't have the bone garbage collector. Yeah, that's right. Interesting, because I think the um, WebAssembly it doesn't have garbage collector, so you have to manually do that stuff again. Um, yeah, but you should be able to bring in the BIM GC, from what I understand. Oh yeah, that's true. That is a C language thing. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have a garbage collector, but hey, you can bring in any language, including a garbage, uh, any library in C, including a garbage collector library. Why not, right? Yeah. It's small. I mean, it's not like it's, it's not like you bring in this huge thing. That's that's really amazing. So I I guess that is something you get by comp by targeting C, which then and then compile that C to. Uh, WebAssembly, uh, web because yeah, you uh, should, you should be able to do that. Yeah, I guess the I people tried. who care about the WebAssembly and not having a garbage collector are people who target from your language directly to WebAssembly directly. Yeah, or like go from, they go from, they could go from CoreRep to C, and then use C to go to LLVM, and then go from LLVM to WebAssembly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Sweet. So this is like I'm just running one of the programs, one of the example programs. Uh huh. Um, oh so yeah, beautiful. I, I like. I, I want. I want to see this. So I just make clean. So I kind of just show what it usually looks like. <laughs> it looks like a pure set compiler. Yeah, and now now it's going through and oh, compiling okay. the, uh, the the core of JSONs, and now it's compiling actually the C code, and now you've got a program. Let's see. Hello, and um, what's kind of cool about this is that, okay, that seems like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but you strip the symbols and then you're stuck, you, you got like 930 kilobytes without optimizations, dare I say. So I think we can even bring this further down. When mm -hmm. you get useful programs at a very small size and it has got um, so this has got the uh, garbage collector statically linked in as well. Mm -hmm. So it's the size of the garbage collector plus um, the code we emit. And you can essentially copy this onto the server and run it anywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty nice. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to think about how big some, some, some of my uh, JavaScript uh, bundles are that I'm Produce from pure script, compile it in the JavaScript, and then bundle it for the browser. Well, I think sometimes those get to be about one megabyte. I think. Yeah, maybe. One or two megabytes. It's, it's kind of large. Be... It's like, yeah, I want to bring it. But like, I, I, I'd bring in like moment.js. <laughs> That's a huge one. Yeah. I uh, yeah, put for like doing times and stuff. 
But the thing is, mm -hmm. even if you get like a, a small JavaScript, let's say like, I don't know, it's like 300 kilobytes, right? Mm -hmm. Then you still need something that actually runs the JavaScript. Yeah, like you if still you want to need build some utility. A node runtime um, for the browser. Yeah, then you have to bring in the node runtime. And like, if I just want to have a small utility like JQ, I, I don't really want to like bring in, so yeah, like I don't install, for example, there's like useful stuff built in Ruby, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to mess around with gems. Like I, I don't care. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just want it to work. I, I don't want to learn your system, how to read your stack traces. Mm -hmm. I just want a little utility. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of where this approach could come in. Yeah. What is the uh, build script that you use for building a build PHP project? Oh, I'm just using make files. Just a make file? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that was a bit of a, <laughs> like, okay, half the project was writing the compiler, the other half the project was figuring out make files. <laughs> 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 but um, now because it, like, it does this thing where, so I'm defining a macro, so let's make first target, so the idea is that you essentially just include this make file and then you can make your own targets using this macro and it t turned out to work surprisingly well so <clears throat> for example the example make file will just look something like this where it says um where it essentially just evaluates this it's not very it's not pretty but it's like it's convenient so essentially you would just evaluate this first make target macro and the rest are arguments. So like, this is the name of the target. This mm -hmm. is the name of the main module. And then you give it the sources and the dependencies. And um, so it will essentially evaluate all of the stuff that's in here. So you get like the fast rebuilding and that sort of stuff all for free. Uh -huh. And you don't have to worry too much about build tooling other than that. That's pretty yeah. neat. Um, I mean, if there's people, if there's going to be interest in people like kind of start chipping in something like pulp for this project, it's not unthinkable. It kind of makes this a bit easier still, but it seemed to make sense at the time and now to use something that is like, you know, in that domain, make files are still a thing uh -huh. and they actually have quite a lot of utility. Um, so, yeah. It seems like the logical thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, I'm trying to think if this. Uh, yeah, yeah, ma it makes pretty neat. Like you, spe you specify like a file that you want to be produced, and how to build that file, and like what dependencies ha there are. Like what, like what other mm. files to be created first, and kind of builds each file through 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 the tree. Yeah, make is pretty great. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know you could do this. Like include stuff with make. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, really happy you should. Yeah. You can, I mean, it gets a bit crazy with like, because you have to escape all of the, the dollar symbols and stuff, but. Mm -hmm. you is, this the way that, is this the way that you recommend people to uh, use PRC? Yeah, that's what I would say, yeah. Like, you'll find that I'm super open to feedback. Like if somebody does more C during the day than me. And that's probably yeah. gonna be a lot of people. Um, I'm like super open to any sort of improvements or yeah. this is the this is the best that I could conceive and it right. seemed to work well. So how it will fare in the open, people actually using it for anything mm -hmm. uh, that be, uh, to be seen, I think. Yeah. Oh that's really neat. Yeah. Oh. I think that's all the questions I've got. Um, yeah. 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 It's, it's yeah. It's too bad that uh, other people didn't ask many questions. But uh, yeah, right. I, yeah. I really enjoyed. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to come and show this off, answer questions and such. Sweet. <clears throat> Cool. Yeah. That's all I got. Okay. Um yeah, I yeah, I guess I don't have anything else, so
Um, not, not, nothing else for me to talk about. Um, so I guess I guess we could end the end the meeting here. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for organizing and making this happen. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have this up on the internet uh, uh, a few hours from now, I think. So. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. We'll see you around. Okay. Yeah. See ya. Yeah. Bye.